Now my boy and I were supposed to leave the club at 2. And we left at 4. And it's 5.33 in the morning when I get into my apartment because transit between the Lower East Side and Crown Heights is a bitch. <laughs> I stripped down to boxers and a coffee stain t-shirt. I forced down leftover Chinese food because my hip bones are getting too sharp. And none of my pants fit. And I think I may be getting too thin to dream. I watch a baby roach crawl across the dining room table and I don't kill it. Because I'm 23 now and there are much bigger things to be afraid of like Donald Trump and gentrification like the train fares going up and my mother finding out I smoke cigarettes. All my friends keep good karma in their cupboards when they're feeling less than holy. Others are chomping on stones while trying to tell a joke. Others are laughing about things we should be crying about. In 20 years, I'll be 43, God willing. 20 years from then, 63. And my heart ends somewhere. Snaps like a wedged bone, like it was never a muscle in the first place. Life is a marathon. Given the opportunity, of course, and I fear I can't stretch myself out far enough because I come from a generation of breakneck baby-faced beasts whose futures look like a cloud of smoke, like an actual rapture, one without warning. They say we become who we're supposed to be for the rest of our lives at 26. That means I got three years to unlearn the awkward cruelty thick on my ribs, three years to stop bashing my skull in before asking for help, to stop confusing telescopes and microscopes, it's an easy mistake. Some things are better understood via rooftops and right under my nose. My best self sometimes wanders around God's boondocks with a dirty needle and a hand grenade. I don't always know how to look for her because I'm too busy bathing in teeth. Sometimes she says I love you, but only when she's being ironic. There's a wishing well in the middle of my dining room table. I drop dollars in it hoping to get a little more bang for my buck, hoping that some heart this sleeve, this mouth, and this person that I happen to be will be worth a story or two. But I run past myself every time I like something too much. I hate missing people. It makes my eyes twitch. I cry much more often than I would like to because it fucks with my aesthetic. And I laugh much more often than I would like to because it fucks with my aesthetic and I don't want to care about a damn thing but I blush at the sound my heart makes. I have seven gray hairs and I don't have a degree and some white asshole just got published when it should have been me and I hate, hate, hate this life. Almost. <laughs> Almost damn near close to as much as I'm in love with being alive. And isn't that a dirty fucking trick? Yeah. <laughs> I'm calling all my closest friends to come marvel at the wreck we've been in. We're all cruel and smart and brilliant and tired. I know that winters in New York be ugly and cold and my track record shows that sometimes my heart be the same. That I'm not as cool as I would like to be, but I'm also not as kind as I think I've convinced God. So I hope I don't come off ironic when I say that this shit stain, body cast of a life, is worth living. Be 20 different people, telling 20 different stories, get lost in the planets, dying inside of you, grow 10 new ones. Forgive him and her and her and him and love him and her and her and him. And forgive yourself for the ways we've all chosen to survive. Because God forbid we feel a goddamn thing and knew exactly how to cope. My generation is looking pretty good dirty. It's playing rough in public places. It's every smart mouth, raw nerving, good people friend I have with shifty intentions and their knapsack filled with fucked up, no good, <coughs> filthy habits. <coughs> Because we're just trying to find ways to stay interested in being alive. Yeah. And we don't always know how to do that right. We don't always know how to do that right.
train ride that I wrote. Um, and this is kind of a, a love poem to my family. When I was 15, my hair was still awkward and long, and a backwards Yankees fitted, face still plump and red with baby fat, and the embarrassment of plain old existing. Post-puberty and pre-diagnosis, my cousins and the boys from Queens would spend weekends wreaking a decent amount of innocent havoc in Ozone Park. We sold a nick bag of stale bud skunk weed to the rich kids from Howard Beach for $35. We spent the money on Colt 45 and Chinese food. We didn't actually talk much. However, we laughed ourselves breathless from our stomachs with our chest out, heartbeats like cloud drums, studying in unison like the sunbeat of brutal bloom and young cacophony and the racket of infinity. Up until that point, the only women we ever loved were our mothers and sisters. We were bruisers and brawlers, hell-raising and restless, came from a long line of hard drugs and bottles. You'll hear my grandpa talk about how all three of my uncles endured a hol holistic detox of blowing horse in his living room. On the holidays, the men would swallow cognac and tell stories in the robust brilliance of day to the sad flat line of night. And we would sneak out with skateboards and sour candy, smell of secondhand brandy and soul food, bought five four locos and salvia, watched Trim Timmy trip balls and stuffed them in the trunk of Joey's Honda. <laughs> Pulled up to the dead end, rolled a blunt the size of a Viking thumb, inhaled it like sky dust, too high to move, passed out till sunrise, till the god fades, wiped our faces clean. And that was the move. That was when it was still a blast. Still a good story to tell. One of these prolific nights, we were drunk under a jungle gym. Just my cousin and I. A year after his dad died, before we knew what hep C even meant, that it could come from a lover or a needle or the rock gut water we were sucking in our faces, we sat in a silence as thick as our dumb skulls. We didn't want to go home. We knew it was the same place it all started. We're one day at a time met one day closer to dead. Didn't want to catch the virus of wanting too much. A fish-shaped lungs. But I still imagine nights like this, you know. Two forties deep in a queen's playground. Laying on my back when it was still tender around these parts. When it was oddly graceful because of mercy, we were still the young kind of young. Had a few more mistakes in us before it got really bad. Had a few more stories to tell at the dinner table before stuffing our mouths with the sorrow mourning the good times Some, somewhere between the bars and the jungle gyms, it all got diluted with my bloodline strategy, which is our dreams, static and stagnant, smacking in our cheeks like flavorless gum, spit it out to anyone who's afraid enough to ignore our bloodshot eyes and how drunk we are and how our laughter is just a smoke signal that we are hoping, friends, you don't happen to notice. This is another new one. Uh, this is dedicated to everyone ever. <laughs> so this is a good place to be for this one. Come, you fair weather saints. You convenient sinners. This right here this is a good fight. Let's join age old sorrows and sad charm our way head first, teeth white, into the bigger picture, which is I don't know why we kick and scream about impermanence. It's the only redeeming quality during desperate times. We the heathens, we the misfits, pray in offbeat vernacular. Talk to God in knotted wailing. Speak in the language of stale heart. I usually fall asleep at 3 a.m. smelling like smoke. 
I gnaw on my knuckles when my nerves are thick, hoping my waters aren't filled with coins engraved by foxhole wishes. We are learning in a strangely humiliating way to stop bringing our throwing knives to the gunfight. Scientifically speaking, none of us know shit <laughs> except everything we've ever lived through. When I was a child and someone caught my nose, I believed them and fought hard to yank it out of their fist. If only I could hold my own grown-up faith to that same standard. Instead, I am enraged and roused and very much afraid. And so it goes. This God cage isn't really a cage, but the backwards of Eden, before the serpent and the apple, back when we were forgiven before, during, and after the trouble was made. And I concur that at times, this kind of love is too dense a tenderness to stomach. Wow. Um, this is a poem called A Love Poem to Your Nihilist. Uh, nihilism, the rejection of all religious and moral principles, often in the belief that life is actually meaningless. It's a light one, I swear. Um, <laughs> every nihilist was probably born with crippling empathy. My generation is filled with that. We all got lockjaw from it and skin like body bags. We all have no chip. We all lack to keep from crime. We all think the universe is just the universe, not a bad father or a good God. It's all pudding. And that's why our mothers keep trying to cheer us up. Keep calling it angst. Our early 20s is only so long, and it will pass once we need our best foot forward into things we believe in. We have tripped over our hearts because they were too swollen for our hands. Every nihilist was probably born with a sleeve to wear it on. My generation is filled with them. We go to the protest, hit the bars, the bed, the moon. Every nihilist was probably born optimistic. My generation is filled with them. We all got the losing half of a wishbone. Please excuse our apathy. Please forgive our tasteless humor. It's just the best way to cope. Every nihilist was probably born feeling everything at once and blushing about it, stuffing our mouths with it. Please understand, we dismiss it nowadays. So there's room to breathe. There is something terrifying and immaculate about having to ask ourselves, what does this all mean? Nothing if you make it so. Everything if you don't. Both if you're uncomfortably human. <laughs> Every nihilist was born uncomfortably alive. My generation is filled with them. We get locked off from laughing about it. Yeah.